The story of Patrice Lumumba is one of hope, struggle, and ultimately, tragedy. As the Democratic Republic of the Congo's first prime minister, he fought tirelessly for the country's independence from Belgium and for the rights of Congolese people. But his legacy is marred by his controversial murder and the countless conspiracy theories that surround it. Born in what was then the Belgian Congo in 1925, Lumumba rose from humble beginnings to become a key figure in the African decolonization movement. Despite his limited education, he was able to attend college and earn a degree in history and geography. He then worked as a postal clerk and later as a journalist, using his platform to advocate for Congolese rights and to call for an end to Belgian colonial rule. In 1960, the Congo finally gained its independence, and Lumumba became the country's first prime minister. But his time in power was plagued by challenges, as the country was divided along ethnic lines and various factions fought for control. As we uncover the truth behind Patrice Lumumba's death, we'll delve into the political turmoil of the time, the role of foreign powers, and the actions of key players. Join us as we explore the life, legacy, and death of Patrice Lumumba and the many conspiracy theories that surround it. In addition to the aforementioned, the Belgian government and other Western powers were hesitant to fully support Congolese independence and sought to maintain their influence in the region. Despite these challenges, Lumumba was determined to build a strong and independent Congo. He sought to modernize the country and improve the lives of its citizens. He also worked to build strong relationships with other African countries and sought support from the Soviet Union and other socialist nations. In retrospect, it was this last part, seeking support from the Soviet Union, that probably led to his demise. We'll explain, the United States and other Western countries were concerned about the spread of communism in Africa and saw Lumumba as a potential threat. As a result, they supported factions within the Congo that were opposed to Lumumba and his government. Lumumba's reliance on the Soviet Union for support also contributed to the West's suspicions of him. This would all play a vital role in his eventual demise, but more on that later. For now, let's address the events leading up to Patrice Lumumba's call for help to the Soviets. Lumumba declared a state of emergency throughout the Congo on August 9, 1960. He then issued several orders in an attempt to re-establish his political dominance. The first prohibited the formation of associations without the approval of the government. A second argued that the government had the right to prohibit publications that produced material that could bring the administration into disrepute. On 11 August, the Courier d'Afrique printed an editorial which declared that the Congolese did not want to fall under a second kind of slavery. The editor was arrested on the spot and the Daily's publication ceased four days later. The government then shut down the Belga and Agence France press wire services. The press restrictions were met with harsh criticism in the Belgian media. Lumumba decreed the nationalization of local Belga offices, establishing the agents Congolais de Press to eliminate what he saw as a center of biased reporting and to create a service through which the government's platform could be more easily communicated to the public. Another order required official approval for public gatherings to be obtained six days in advance. Lumumba announced the establishment of a six-month special military regime on August 16. Throughout August, Lumumba withdrew from his full cabinet, instead consulting with trusted officials and ministers like Maurice Mpolo, Joseph Mbuyi, Kashimura, Gizinga, and Ntoin Kiwa. Lumumba's office was in disarray, and few of his employees were productive. His chief of staff, Damien Candolo, was frequently absent and acted as a spy for the Belgian government. Lumumba was constantly fed rumors from informants and the Serete, which encouraged him to be extremely suspicious of others. Serge Michael, his press secretary, enlisted the help of three Belgian telex operators who provided him with copies of all outgoing journalistic dispatches in an attempt to keep him informed. 
Lumumba immediately ordered Congolese troops to put down the rebellion in secessionist South Kasai, which housed strategic rail links needed for a Katanga, a mineral-rich province, which had earlier declared independence under regional premier Mos Chom on 11 July, with support from the Belgian government and mining companies such as Union Minier. Although the operation was successful, the conflict quickly devolved into ethnic violence. The army took part in massacres of Luba civilians. The people and politicians of South Kasai held Lumumba personally accountable for the army's actions. Only a federalist government, according to Kasa Vubu, can bring peace and stability to the Congo. This shattered his tenuous political alliance with Lumumba and shifted the country's political balance away from Lumumba's unitary state. Ethnic tensions rose against him, and the country's still powerful Catholic Church openly criticized his government. Even with South Kasai under control, the Congo lacked the strength to retake Katanga. Lumumba had called an African conference for August 25 to 31 in Leopoldville, but no foreign heads of state showed up, and no country pledged military support. Lumumba demanded once more that UN peacekeeping troops assist in putting down the revolt, threatening to send in Soviet troops if they refused. Lumumba was later denied the use of UN forces. The possibility of direct Soviet intervention was becoming more likely. President Kasa Vubu began to worry about a Lumumbist coup d'etat. On the evening of September 5, Kasa Vubu announced over the radio that he had fired Lumumba and six of his ministers for the massacres in South Kasai and for involving the Soviets in the Congo. Lumumba went to the national radio station, which was under UN guard, after hearing the broadcast. Despite being ordered to bar Lumumba's entry, UN troops let him in because they had no specific instructions to use force against him. Lumumba called his dismissal as illegitimate over the radio, labeling Casa Vubu a traitor and declaring him deposed. Casa decision Vubu's was legally invalid because he had not declared the approval of any responsible ministers. Lumumba mentioned this in a letter to Hammarskjöld and a radio broadcast on September 6 at 5.30. Later that day, Casa Vubu obtained the countersignatures of Albert Delvaux, minister resident in Belgium, and Justin Marie Bomboko, minister of foreign affairs, to his order. At 16 o'clock, he announced his dismissal of Lumumba and six other ministers over Brazzaville radio. Lumumba and his loyal ministers ordered the arrest of Delvaux and Bomboko for countersigning the dismissal order. The latter sought refuge in the presidential palace, which was guarded by UN peacekeepers, but the former was detained and confined in the prime minister's residence early on September 7. Meanwhile, the Chamber of Deputies met to debate Casa dismissal Vubu's order and Lumumba's response. Delvox unexpectedly appeared on the dais to denounce his arrest and announce his resignation from the government. The opposition enthusiastically applauded him. Lumumba then gave his speech. Rather than directly attacking Casa Vubu, Lumumba accused obstructionist politicians and ABAKO of using the presidency to conceal their activities. He noted that Casa Vubu had never previously criticized the government and had always portrayed their relationship as one of cooperation. He chastised Delvaux and Finance Minister Pascal Mkayi for their roles in the UN Geneva talks and for failing to consult the rest of the government. Lumumba concluded his arguments by analyzing the Loi Fundamental and requesting that Parliament convene a commission of sages to investigate the Congo's problems. On the recommendation of its presiding officer, the chamber voted 60 to 19 to overturn Casa and Vubu's Lumumba's dismissal declarations. The following day, Lumumba delivered a similar speech before the Senate which gave the government a confidence vote of 49 to 0, with seven abstentions. Article 51 grants Parliament the exclusive privilege of interpreting the Constitution. The Congolese were originally supposed to appeal constitutional questions to the Belgian Conseil d'État in cases of doubt and controversy. With the rupture of relations in July, this was no longer possible, 
so there was no authoritative interpretation or mediation to bring the dispute to a legal conclusion. Lumumba was taken aback by the coup, and that evening he traveled to Camp Leopoldu in search of Mobutu in order to persuade him to change his mind. He spent the night there before being attacked by Luba soldiers, who blamed him for the atrocities in South Kasa. A Ghanaian ONUC team was able to free him, but his briefcase was left behind. Some of his political opponents recovered it and published documents it supposedly contained, including letters from Nkrumah, appeals for support addressed to the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, a memorandum dated 16 September declaring the presence of Soviet troops within one week, and a letter dated 15 September from Lumumba to the provincial presidents entitled, Measures to be Applied During the First Stages of the Dictatorship. Some of these documents were authentic, while others, particularly the memorandum and letter to the provincial presidents, were almost certainly forgeries. Despite the coup, African diplomats worked to bring Lumumba and Casa Vuvu back together. According to Ghanaians, a verbal agreement on the principle of closer cooperation between the head of state and the government was written down. Lumumba signed it, but Casa Vuvu refused to sign it back. Ghanaians suspected Belgium and the United States of being involved. Chomi had declared that he would not participate in any discussions with a government that included the communist Lumumba. Mobutu, then the chief of staff of the Congolese army, seized power in a bloodless coup on September 14, 1960, deposing Lumumba and his government. Lumumba was arrested and imprisoned, and a new government was installed led by President Joseph Kasavubu and Prime Minister Ntwane Gizinga. Lumumba, on the other hand, refused to accept defeat and continued to resist from prison, calling on his supporters to rise up against the new government. As Congo's political situation worsened, Mobutu and his allies became increasingly concerned about Lumumba's influence and the threat he posed to their power. Lumumba was transferred from prison to a military camp in Thisville on January 17, 1961, where he was beaten and tortured by Mobutu's men. On January 17, he was transferred to a military base in Katanga and handed over to local authorities who were supported by the Belgian government and opposed to Lumumba. Lumumba was assassinated on January 17, along with two of his political allies, Maurice Sampolo and Joseph Okido. The coup and Lumumba's assassination marked a watershed moment in Congo's history, ushering in decades of dictatorship, corruption, and conflict. Mobutu, renamed Mobutu C. Siko, went on to rule Congo for more than 30 years, transforming it into one of Africa's most corrupt and repressive regimes. The country's resources were looted, the economy was destroyed, and the people were oppressed during his reign. Lumumba's legacy, on the other hand, has endured, with many Congolese viewing him as a symbol of national pride and resistance to foreign dominance. In the end, the end Patrice Lumumba died a hero, while Mobutu lived long enough to become the villain of the story. We hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below where do you think Congo would be if Lumumba was left in power. Thanks for watching. Please remember to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an update from us. And we'll see you in another video.